to hear some good teaching. Praise the Lord. Well, thank God it's not come from me. It's come from someone else. From a, a well-experienced teacher, anointed, powerful. Hallelujah. Y'all going to get some good teaching this morning. Praise the Lord. We're going to go ahead and uh, ask the ushers to come and uh, take up a Sunday school offering. Um, so if you want to get that together. And... Um, Praise the Lord. Ask Brother Terry if he'll pray over the offering. Praise the Lord. Uh, we're going to ask Sister Turner if she, uh, she's ready. She can come on. Well, praise the Lord, everybody. Once again, we're in the house of God. <clears throat> you know, we are so blessed to be here today. Don't excuse my voice. Uh, I was hearing this week about the persecuted Christians in some of these other nations. And right at, the, at this time, we still have the privilege of coming together without having to hide or fear persecution or be put in jail or be pr imprisoned. And um, so where this, um, this minister in Canada, they've imprisoned him because he refuses to close his church and he's was originally from, thank you so much, Is it better? Um, and because he's from Poland, he was from Poland and he's in Canada, and because he refuses, because he says he knows what Hitler's like and he knows what uh, the Nazi is like and that's what uh, their country is headed for, so he's in jail. But thank God, we're here today. We have freedom to worship God. Isn't that wonderful? Praise God. I think we should be very thankful that we have this privilege to do this, to hear the word of God. In Finland, they're talking about putting them in jail because they put a scripture in a text. We are blessed to still be able to speak the word of God and to text the word of God to someone, to a friend or whatever. So today we're going to talk about something that is so important. It's about knowing God's will. And I've got umpteen scriptures <laughs> umpteen scriptures and they want all these scriptures to uh, to get out there so I, I may uh, I hope I get through with it and um, but I'm going to read our scriptures and uh, and we're going to talk about the will of God and we all want the will of God it's the will of God that we all go to heaven but God's got a will that we have to fulfill to get there understanding we're going to start off understanding the will of God how do we understand the will of God the first thing is by knowing him in 2nd Corinthians uh, 4 verse 6 and y'all have your little uh, papers there when it comes time for you to fill in the blanks but in this one I just read it for you it's we understand the will of God by knowing him in 2 Corinthians 4 and 6, it says, For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Beautiful scripture. 
We know God by knowing God's plan. Luke 19 and 10 says, For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. Why? Because all were lost. The Word of God says, For all have sinned and fell short of the glory of God. We had to have a Savior. 1 Thessalonians 4, 1 through 7. Furthermore, then, we beseech you, brethren, exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as you have received of us how you ought to, and you're going to fill in the blanks, so uh, that as you have received of us how you, you got your paper, what does it say? Walk. Walk. That's walk. That as you have received of us how you ought to walk. In other words, live your life in the will of God. How you ought to walk and to please God so that you would, and your blank is, abound more and more. For you know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. Now we're talking about the will of God. It says, for this is the will of God, even your blank sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel, his body, in sanctification, and your blank is in honor. So we are to possess the will of God, our vessels, our bodies, we are to possess that in sanctification. Simply means we are a separated people. We're not like the world. That word um, sep uh, sanctification, and you know a lot of people say we're a sanctified people. Well, you know what? If you've got the Holy Ghost, you're a sanctified person. Praise God. Sanctified. Set apart to God. That's wonderful. Sanctified people. The Word of God says come out from among them. Be separate, saith the Lord. We live a separated life that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and what? Honor. Honor. Not in the lust, and I'll probably mispronounce this, not in the lust of concupiscence or concupiscence, however you pronounce it, pronounce it, not in the lust of concupiscence. What does that word mean? It simply means it's someone that sets their heart. I mean, sometimes even with a fierceness. It's such a lust, and it's for that which is forbidden. That which is forbidden. That you, not in the lust of concoptions, even as the Gentiles, which know not God, that was you and me, the Gentiles, that no man go beyond and defraud his brother, in any matter because that the Lord is the avenger of all such as we all as we also have forewarned you and testified for God has not called us unto uncleanness but unto what holiness God has called us to holiness we're sanctified we're a holy people People say, well, I'm just a sinner. No, we, when we come to God, we have been sanctified. We've been called to be holy. So we are not a sinner. Yes, we were a sinner. And when we come to God, yes, we still th have things that we have to overcome and we have to pray and repent of. But no, we are a saint. That's what the Word of God calls us. We are saints of God. So God's will is for us to present our body. This is a beautiful scripture here. Of course, Robert told me this morning, he said, you have about 500 favorites. This is uh, Romans 12, 1 through 2. Paul is writing to the Romans. He says, I beseech you therefore, brethren. And if I had the time, I would tell you something about that word brethren and what it really entails in the Greek. It is beautiful. We would view, we would view our brothers and sisters differently if you knew the very root of what that word brethren means. You would love your brother. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies 
a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is good, prove that which is good and acceptable and perfect and the perfect will of God. It's a couple of things that stuck out to me in, in that scripture. Well, there's a lot of things that stuck out in that scripture. But one of them is that we present our bodies a living sacrifice unto God. Number one, these bodies, once we come to God, we're in them, but they really belong to God. It is the temple. This is the temple of God. When God puts his spirit within you, it is the temple of God because his presence, his spirit resides within us. It says that you're not to be conformed to this world. What is the world? Yeah, we're in the world. It's not talking about the earth, but when it says world, what it's literally talking about is you're not to be conformed to the spirit of this world. Because what is the spirit of this world? Who is the God of this world? Satan is the God of this world. So just as Brother Michael taught last week, what is it? Lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, and the pride of life. All sin falls under those three categories. Every sin. So we're not to be conformed. And if you don't pray and, and seek God diligently, you can be conformed. You can be conformed. But it says don't be conformed, but be transformed. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. What is that? It's like a metamorphosis takes place in you, your, in your mind. You're transformed. This metamorphosis takes place just like that cocoon and how that butterfly comes out. It's a metamorphosis that takes place. Well, when we are born of God, there is a metamorphosis that takes place by the renewing of our mind. When we come to God, uh, we look at things a whole lot differently. If you'll go back to when you were a sinner, then go back to that day when you came to God, and you think about what did your life become like from that point forward. We began to look at things. We have a different perspective. We have a different outlook. We see things through different eyes because now we have changed. There's been a, a change of ownership, in other words. Satan owned us. You may say, no, 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 no. Yes, 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 yes. You were owned by Satan and your flesh. But when we come to Jesus, our eyes are open, and we change, and there is a change that takes place because now we have a new master. It's not Satan, and it's not our flesh. It is the Lord. It is the Lord Jesus Christ that we have now surrendered our life to. And because of that, our desires change. We see things differently. We live differently because that old man has died and that new man has been born. So we are a new creation in Christ. And I'll never get through this lesson going this slow because it's 11 pages. <laughs> I may just have to read the scriptures to you. But they're so good, they need to be talked about. I mean, literally, this lesson should have two or three weeks because it is so much involved inside each one of these scriptures because it is the Word of God. It's God's Word. Nothing any greater than the Word of God. So now we have a new, new owner, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And this, the, you have this on your, your paper. You can read along with me. The rate at which you are able to comprehend what? Y'all got the paper? Truth. The rate at which you are able to comprehend truth and your ability to bring your lifestyle into, you have to fill in the blank, 
harmony with the Spirit will depend a great deal on your understanding of how to know what? The will of God. How to know the will of God. Well, first of all, why did Jesus, what was the purpose of Jesus Christ coming to man? Uh, that he would become a man, that he could come to man. Because he wanted, everything was lost in the garden. He wanted a relationship with his creation. So we see that he came as a man, that he could be acquainted with us and we could be acquainted with him. And we can take the things that God has for us and apply them to our life. You know, when it comes to knowing the will of God, uh, and there are certain things when you're praying about a personal thing, you have to really seek God to find that will. But as far as living for God, it's no great mystery knowing the will of God. It's no great mystery. Just like, you know, uh, like it says, you know, the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ came to seek and to save us. So we see this is also in your, on your paper. What a spiritual thrill to understand even in part that I am God's and he is mine. Think of that. I belong to God. But you know what? God is mine. It's not just that, that, uh, uh, that I know God, but God is my God, and I am his child. The Bible says, Christ in you, the hope of glory. I'm in Christ, and Christ is in me. We are one in reality. You are one with Christ when you are born of the Spirit of God. It says, and upon this fact rests a comfortable, livable, in the blankest knowledge that we will be led, led by the Spirit, and not, and that not astray. The Lord's going to lead no one astray. That's pretty common sense. He's God. Ver, uh, the ch ver, uh, number four on your paper. We must, quote, accept God's will before we can know it. It is like a door. We must accept what's behind the door before we can open it. And the way I see this is we've got to accept the will of God you may not know what the will of God is, but you have to be willing because you know God will not lead you astray. I thought of Jesus when he was in the garden. Now, he knew that it was the will of God for him to go to Calvary. He knew that. But yet that was a hard thing. But he prayed, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. So we have to be willing to accept the will of God, even when we don't know what it is. Also, knowing the will of God is knowing that his, and this is on your paper, that his what? His ways are not ours. You can say amen to that. You can say amen. Romans eleven thirty three. 33. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable, unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. Why is that? Because his ways are not like our ways. His thoughts are not like our thoughts. The word of God says as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are his ways higher than our ways. That's God. He's above us. He's creator. He's almighty. So our ways are not his ways. Our thoughts are not his thoughts. But that's where we turn to the spirit of the Lord and the word of God. And we pray and we seek God's will in our life. And we are also familiar, know this, the flesh, and you have this on your paper, the flesh versus the spirit. Can you say amen to that? I'm telling you, I'm telling you, you'll, you'll, you'll be in a service and everything be going wonderful. Oh, I'm on a fast a week. That night, oh, goodness, I've got to have something to eat. My stomach is burning, and I just must have it. Flesh and spirit, it says it envies, it lusteth against each other because the spirit wants to rule. 
the flesh wants to rule. And it's according to me and it's according to you who rules in our life. It's according to which one we give the opportunity to be the ruler in our life. In Romans 8, 5 through 14. For they that are after, and in parentheses, for they that are after the what? The flesh. Do mind the things of the flesh. They that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. Verse 6. For to be carnally minded is death. Carnal really it just means that unregenerate mind. That, that human nature that we were born with. But when we are born of God, we are to strive and pray and do all we can to keep that carnal nature under subjection to the Spirit of God. And that's why I say the Spirit of God, the Spirit and the flesh are in a warfare. They are at odds. And you can win the victory over something. But let me tell you, you haven't won the war yet. You will not win the war until you leave here. Every, Paul said, I die daily. And if the apostle Paul had to crucify his flesh when he wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, who are you and I? We must fight this fight that we are in. We must give over to the spirit of the Lord and not the flesh. But it's a daily thing. For to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace because the carnal mind is enmity against God. And I thought, Lord, I want to look up that word enmity and just see exactly what it means. And that word uh, enmity, it literally means hostility. It means opposition. It even means hatred. I see people in this world and the things that's going on where they hate God. The things that are taking place, we see it in the natural, but if you go to the root, it is a hatred for God and the hatred for the things of God. But now he's, he's writing to the church. He's writing to the Romans. Because the carnal mind is enmity. It is opposite. It is hostile. It is hostile to against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But you, but you, let's listen to this. But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. We've been born of the spirit. We've had the second birth, and the Spirit is within us. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin. But the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you what's going to get us out of the grave in the resurrection if we're going to heaven it's going to be the spirit of God it's going to be the Holy Ghost that is in this vessel that is in this temple it may be gone back to the dust of the earth. There may not be but a speck of dust in that wherever, in the ocean, in the, in the grave, in the whatever. But it doesn't matter. We were all created by God. He knows that dust. He knows that particle. And we're going to be resurrected. The dead in Christ are going to rise up. The Word of God says it. So that same spirit that raised Jesus up out of the grave, he's given us a promise here that one day that we too, our mortal bodies, will be raised up. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. For if you live after the flesh, you shall die. You can backslide. 
You can be born of God. You can be born of the Spirit of God. But once again, the flesh and the Spirit war, you've got to fight the good fight of faith and let the Spirit have rule in your life. We're, uh, if we live after the flesh, we'll die. But if through the Spirit do mortify, what does that mean? That simply means put to death. Put to death the deeds of the body you shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. And this is on your paper. The Spirit knows the what? The mind of God. 1 Corinthians 2, 9 through 16. But as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. But God has revealed them unto us by his, what? Spirit. He's revealed them to us by his spirit. For the spirit searcheth all things. Yea, and in your blank, yea, the deep things of God. Like the word of God says, the deep calleth unto the deep. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man, which is in him? You know, only we know what's within us. I don't know what's in you. You don't know what's in me. But the spirit of man that is within us, we know. For what knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even the things of God knoweth no man, but the spirit of God. That goes right back. The spirit of God knoweth all things. And if we're led by the Spirit of God, we're the sons of God. Now, we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. And this right here is on your paper, and you'll fill in the blank. But the what natural, the natural man, that unregenerate man, receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he, quote, in parentheses, know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. And this is in yours. For who hath known the mind of God, of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But let's listen to this. But we have the, and yours, the little piece of life there, we have the mind of Christ. When we were born of God, Remember, we have a new owner, new ownership. God, he's Lord. We have the mind of Christ. But this is something that you and I, it doesn't just come natural. It doesn't just come natural. But it says we have the mind of Christ. In other words, what is it? We, our minds have been what transformed by the renewing of the mind? Transformed by the renewing of the mind. I have a nephew, and he said his preacher preached on that. And he said, now I go around saying, I have the mind of Christ. I have the mind of Christ. He's got me doing it. I have the mind of Christ. Point to your head. I have the mind of Christ. The mind of Christ. Glory of God in Christ. We all know this scripture. We could probably just quote it from heart. John 1 verse 1 and verse 14. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse 14. And the Word was made flesh, praise God, and dwelt among us, and we beheld what? His glory. 
we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. God's will was to manifest himself to mankind. Praise God. A fle- you don't see a spirit. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. He had to manifest himself from the foundation of the earth. That was his, that was his plan. It was God's will to manifest himself to his creation, to man. I think it's wonderful. Express image. Express image. It's on your, your page. Hebrews 1 and 3. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express, you're blank, and the express image of his person. And upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Praise God. The right hand of power. His own right arm has brought salvation to us. Okay, we're, we're talking about understanding the will of God. We're going to look at Jesus. This is on your paper. Look at Jesus. What is Jesus? He is our example. God is what? Rational. Now, sometimes we're not rational. Let's get real. But God is rational. He makes sense. Number two, God is consistent. This, uh, you know, I may say, man, I got up on the wrong side of the bed this morning. Well, God doesn't slumber or sleep, so he doesn't get up on the wrong side of the bed. We see God is consistent. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. What he was yesterday, he is today, and what he is today, he'll be that tomorrow. God is consistent. Malachi 3 and 6 says, For I am the Lord, I am God, I change not. God does not change. He does not change his mind. Therefore, you sons of Jacob are not consumed. God is an unchanging God. So we can understand the will of God. If it is the will of God for uh, holiness and sanctification in the beginning, it's still the will of God for holiness and sanctification now. If it says that you are to abstain from fornication, then it's the same thing today. God does not change. He's the same. He stays the same. So we can understand his will. We can understand uh, our God because, and he gives us his word. To me, the word of God is simply God in, in black and white. It's been written, it's been put down on paper, and he's given it to us that he might reveal himself to us through the written word of God. We are so blessed to have that word of God. We are blessed. It tells us how to be born again. It tells us how to live. It tells what it takes to go to heaven. It tells what he loves. It tells what he hates. He's given us the powerful word of God that's sharper than any two-edged sword. I'm telling you, we can praise God for this beautiful word of God that he gives us. It becomes more precious to me the longer I live. It becomes more open to me every day that I live. It'll soon be 53 years, and I'll be reading, and I'm telling you, it's like it just opens up, and I think, how many times have I read this in all these years? But it's like you get the revelation at that time. It's wonderful. Who? that's not a part of the lesson. God is totally what? Aware. God is totally aware. Your scripture, Proverbs 15 and 3, the eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. You know, when I read that, I had this, I don't know, this came over me. And I thought, okay, God, he sees everything in every 
nation, in every person. He sees the child pornography. He sees the sex trafficking. He sees the murder. He sees the corruption. He sees the heart of man. He sees the good that's being done. He sees everything about everybody, about everything that this whole world encompasses. Now, you may get something different out of that than what I do. But what I felt was this. I don't even belong in this place. The Word of God says we're pilgrims. This is not, I'm here temporarily. And if we live a hundred years, it's a dot. It's a grain of sand on the seashore to eternity. I'm telling you, people, this place is not our home. We're just passing through. We're sojourners. We're just traveling. But while we're traveling here, we're getting ready to go to our eternal home. And it's according to what we do here on this earth where our home is going to be. But praise God. And I'm not saying, I don't mean that self-righteous when I say I don't belong here. I don't mean it. God knows the heart. But literally, I just felt like I don't belong here. I don't belong. And I don't think I'm here forever anyway. I'm not here forever. This is on your paper, number four. God is within what? Reach. God is within reach. Hebrews 4.15. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with a feeling of our infirmities. Well, after all, he made us. But was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. He was tempted, but there was no sin in him. None. Zero. Zilch. He could not be our Savior if it was without sin. So he can be touched. He understands us. He was a man. He was 100% God. But he was also 100% flesh. He had this like we do. So he can be touched. He understands the things that we go through. He sees the things he go, that we go through. He walked in the flesh. So he, we have a high priest that can be touched by the feeling of our infirmities. Also, God is what? Able. God is able. Ephesians 3, 19 through 21. And to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. God is able. Number six, God is what? He's realistic. He knows our limitations. He knows we're not God. He knows we're not Him. There's one God, and it's Him. That doesn't mean He allows us to be promiscuous or to go against His Word and still be right. No. But thank God, the Bible says if we sin... We have an advocate, the man Christ Jesus. We can go to him and we can repent. Thank God for that because we all have to do it. But we don't, you don't walk in sin. You don't live in sin. You don't continue in sin. No. You may sin, but you must repent. You must repent. To know the love of Christ, God, number six, God is realistic. As I said, he knows we're dust. He knows. The word of God says, I believe it's in Psalms. It says, as a father pities his children, so does God pity us because he remembers that we are dust. We are dust. We're made from the dust, and we're going to go back to the dust. Okay, now we're going to look at what the will of God is not. Ephesians 5, 17. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, 
as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward. What are we talking about? What is not the will of God? Not willing that any should perish. He takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked, the Word of God said. He doesn't take pleasure in that. He so loved the world, right? But the will, it is not the will of God for man to perish. But his will is, but that all should come to repentance. All should come to repentance. Hell was never created for you and me. Hell was created for the fallen angels. It's not God's will that any should perish for them to be lost. And, and you know that this is just my, I guess, carnal thinking, but it has to grieve the heart of God to see man go the direction that they are going because most men are going to be lost. When I say men, I mean mankind. That's not me saying that. That's the word of God. It's the word of God. God's will is to preach. This is on your paper that you have. Romans 10, 9 through 15. That if thou shalt, what? The blank. Confess. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt, blank, believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou, blank, shalt be saved. Are y'all with me? For with the heart, man, what does he do? Believeth. The blank is believeth. For with the heart, man, believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth, the blank, confession, <laughs> is made unto salvation for the scripture saith whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed I'm so thankful oh I'm so thankful that I believe on him for there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek for the same Lord over all a -L -L, is rich unto all that call upon him for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. God is no respecter of persons. It doesn't matter our color. It doesn't matter our race. It doesn't matter how big we are, how little we are. It doesn't matter what our occupation is. It doesn't matter. He is no respecter of persons. Man was created in the image and the likeness of God. Man. All men. How then shall they call upon him whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him and who they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? There's Brother Hunt. And how shall they preach except they be sent? It's the will of God. As it is written... How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. It's the will of God for God's word to be preached. It is the will of God to heal. This is his word. 1 Peter 2 and 24. Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree. That we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness by whose stripes ye were healed. It is God's will to deliver. God's will to deliver. A big part of Jesus' ministry was in deliverance. He healed. He delivered from demons. He preached. He taught. He went around doing good. But it's the will of God to deliver. Matthew 8, 32, And he said unto them, Go. And when they were come out, they went into the herd of swine. This is talking about the demons. And behold, the whole herd of swine ran violently down a deep, a steep, 
place into the sea and perished in the water. You can't help but think about, here's, they say it was about 2,000 swine. It's hard to believe. You wonder, how can anybody have that many demons? But even the pigs, it made the pigs crazy. They ran down the hill, and they were, went into the water, and they were drowned. But let me tell you, those demons are still living. Their spirit, they're still out here in this world, and I think it's a whole bunch of them loose. So Jesus delivered, and he still delivers. We're going to look at Jesus' prayer. This is really a beautiful prayer that Jesus prayed in, in John 17. Verse 9 through 26, it's a little lengthy. Whew, I got four minutes. I'm trying real hard. I don't have but three pages. I'm, this may go real fast, y'all. I may put it on speed dial. I pray for them. This is Jesus. I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine, and all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee, Holy Father. Keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. We are one with Christ. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that, gavest me, those that thou gavest me, I have kept. And none of them is lost, but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. And now come I to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them thy word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. And this is in yours, I believe. It's, it's in dark. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the what? The world. God's not asking, Jesus is not praying that we be taken out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from what? The evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Verse 17, sanctify them through thy what? Truth. Thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through thy word. And I'm just going to cut this in. Uh, I'm going to have to cut that one off. Let me see if I can. Whew, this was a long one. We're going to skip on down, and this is on y'all's page. It's understanding what the will of the Lord is. One, does, uh, one thing about the will of the Lord is it's 100%. It's not partial. It's not partial. Also, it says bloom where you are what? Planted. When God saves you, it doesn't mean you can't go and visit another church that's having a revival. But bloom where you're planted. Grow there. World evangelism starts to front at your front what? Door. Through family, friends, community. Acts 1 says, but you shall receive what? Power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be what? Witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, all Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost part of the earth. That means Mississippi, Tennessee, Arkansas, and all the other. God's will is easy to what? Find. Matthew 7 and 7, it says, ask and it shall be given you. Seek and you shall find. Seek, and it sh you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. Everyone that asketh receiveth. He that seeketh findeth. He that knocketh, it shall be opened. For what man is it of you? If your son asks bread, you're going to give him a stone. If he wants a fish, you're going to give him a serpent. If, if you're evil and you give good gifts, how much more shall your heavenly Father? Okay, I'm sorry. I've got one minute. I've got to just. I was told I had to do all this. Okay. Knowing the will of God, how are we going to know it? And I may not get through. It's 1120. How are we going to know the will of God? Proverbs 3 and 6 says, In all thy ways acknowledge him. And what, what is he going to do? He's going to direct your path. He will 
direct your path. So I must present my what body and life to the Lord for the service and not let the world put me into its mold, but let the Lord change and renew my mind so that I can show his perfect will in my life. And it is 1120, and I like a little bit, but I'm going to stop because it is time for us to take a break. And uh, I pray that you got something out of this. Uh, it, like I say, it was so much in there that could be said, could be taught. It was uh, so many wonderful scriptures. But if you will, let's stand and just close with a moment of prayer, please. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful, God. Lord, that once again that we are in the house of the living He shut up, the living God. We are so thankful, Lord God, that you've given us this opportunity. We're so grateful, God, for each and every one that is here. I pray your blessings upon each one and upon each home, oh God. And I pray that the word that we hear, God, will be more than just something that we hear, more than just something that we speak, but, God, something that we live and something, God, that we will abide in, oh God. Just as your word says that you abide in us and we abide in you, may your word abide in us and may it bring forth great fruit God in these latter days for your glory oh God we worship and honor you for you are the true living God the king of kings and the lord of lords and we give you glory in Jesus name amen